Okay, um, so yeah, as Ralph just said, I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing over the last few years with, um, with the group in Hamburg. So that's Jan Louis, uh, Christoph Horst, Hagen Trindle, and mathematician uh, Vicente Cortez, and also uh, a guy in Indonesia, Bobby Gunnar. So, um, why n equals 2 supersymmetry? I'd like to give a few rough words of motivation, just uh, it's probably not necessary at all for this audience, but uh, let's see. So, compactifications of string theory obviously often lead to n equals 2 supergravity in four dimensions, with many massless scalar fields or moduli. N equals two supersymmetric field theories are very constrained with many relations between the various couplings which make them easier to study. But of course, there's no chiral fermions, which means phenomenologically, they're maybe not so interesting, you would think. However, it turns out that um, various phenomenologists over the years have studied the idea that perhaps the standard model or the MSSM has a further extension in the gauge sector, which has extended supersymmetry. And this actually has very different signals compared to the MSSM. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, another option is that you could look at uh, uh, n equals 2 Dirac fermions or the, the mirror fermion partners to our regular fermions as being dark matter candidates. And this has been studied by various people and uh, in fact people have been looking at things even for the LHC for this. So a general overall question one could ask then is can n equals 2 supersymmetry be spontaneously broken to n equals 1 perhaps in some visible sector in a way in which you can realize a low energy chiral spectrum? This is obviously quite a difficult problem. It's perhaps not possible. But what we've done to begin with is tried to have a systematic study of spontaneous supersymmetry breaking in supergravity. So why did we have to study it? Well, it turns out that uh, long ago now, there was a, a famous no-go theorem which said that for a very large class of supergravity theories, you couldn't break n equals 2 to n equals 1 supersymmetry. This is the title of the paper by uh, Ciccotti, Girardello, and Parati. But of course, what happened, like with all good no-go theorems, some time later, some counterexamples were found. So using some very special choices of matter content in n equals 2 supergravity, Ferrara and collaborators uh, find a way around this no-go theorem. So what did we do then? Well, it's all about this uh, special choices here. We used a, a, a new formalism that was introduced in supergravity called the embedding tensor formalism to show that, in fact, one can find an n equals 1 vacuum in any abelian n equals 2 supergravity with two commuting isometries. Furthermore, we just very recently looked at whether one could realize uh, n equals 2 and n equals 1 vacuum inside the Kähler cone in a given supergravity, and we found the answer was yes, but you have to check case by case. So what I want to do uh, in the rest of the little talk today is just explain a little bit more about this result. And in particular, I want to explain about the utility of the embedding tensor formalism because it seems, a bit, uh, it seems a bit unusual to a lot of people, and so I hope I can at least motivate why it's useful to use. So the embedding tensor formalism was introduced by DeWitt and collaborators some time ago now, and essentially the embedding tensor itself is just a, a matrix of charges. It's taken to be spurionic, so you set this guy up to begin with and you allow it to transform such that you can reinstate various uh, dualities in the theory, and then at the end, you fix it to a constant value. So basically what this matrix does is it selects the subset of your global symmetry generators that are going to be gauged in your gauge theory. So here they are. These are going to be the guys that you gauge, and these are the global ones over here. And this matrix just selects what's what. This, can handle, uh, this formalism can handle electric and magnetic charges. And uh, a gauging in, generally, in general, then, you'll, you'll write down in this way. So you have some scalar field over here. And under a gauge transformation, you now say it goes like some parameter, these uh, matrices themselves, and then just some killing vectors in your sigma model, for instance. And then covariant derivatives, they're simply defined like this. So everywhere before you just have a, you had a gauge field, you can now just throw in this extra guy and the killing vectors. But of course, if you have electric and magnetic charges around, you have to be careful. And, uh, and what uh, one does is you enforce an additional constraint called mutual locality which makes sure you can always rotate back to a frame where you only have electric charges and everything makes sense, all your physics makes sense. So <coughs> this is all fine, but how can we actually use this formalism to, to do something interesting with the physics in the end? And so this is the main, uh, the main thing I want to convey today on this slide. The advantage of the embedding tensor formalism 
is that one can leave the matter content of your supergravity theory general. You want to fix then the physical characteristics that you're interested in, so some, some physics that you want to find, and then you go about solving for the gaugings and the charges in terms of this embedding tensor that will allow you to find that physics. So in some sense, what you do is, is you fix the physics, and then you're able to solve for the theory that you want afterwards. So it's a bit of a flip around to what we usually do. Usually we take a supergravity, fix the charges, and say, oh, does this have black holes? Does this have partial supersymmetry breaking? Does it have some interesting uh, solutions? But this is something else. This is really that we say we want to find some particular physics, and we want to know which theories will allow us to have that. And this is really all possible because of this interest in formalism where this guy's spurionic and uh, it, it allows for a very general setup. So here's the application, and this is what we did over a series of papers over the last, uh, uh, yeah, like the last four years now. So to find an n equals one supersymmetric vacuum of an n equals two supergravity, we can simply solve the Killing Spinner equations. So these are the guys that follow from the supersymmetry transformation. Now, obviously, in general, these are quite complicated. I don't want to write them all down in the slides for you, so I'm going I'm to have cartoon equations here. So nevertheless, for a Minkowski vacuum, if we want to find a Minkowski n equals 1 supersymmetric vacuum, um, these Killing Spinner equations simplify to just the scalar parts. So we have some matrix here, which you can write in terms of uh, the embedding tensor itself, so basically just the charges. The scalar fields in your theory, which I'll call Qs, and the isometries on, on the sigma model, the Ks. And so then all for, for all maximally symmetric spaces, actually, the supersymmetry transformations reduce to something very simple like this. Now, if we want to find an n equals 1 vacuum, we need to, we need to find a particular solution to, to the equations which follow from this. So an n equals 1 vacuum is found like this. You have, uh, for n equals 2, for instance, which I'm interested in here, you have one of these scalar matrices coming from the, killer spin the killing spinner equation, and it, it has the equation to zero like this. So you have to solve one of these guys to zero, and that tells you that you have one unbroken supersymmetry. But importantly, you have to break the other supersymmetry. So you need to find some solution for these S matrices, which allow this equation to vanish, and this equation to be non-zero. So at this point, it's worth um, reminding what the, the 1984 no-go theorem did. It basically showed that in n equals 2 supergravity for a very large class of theories, all the matrices of interest in any fermionic variation like this, so this can be any fermion in your theory at all, all of these matrices were basically proportional to the identity matrix, which means that you can never have this situation where one of these guys vanishes and the other doesn't. So what we did then is simply solve these equations for these uh, scalar mass matrices that appear here. These, these guys essentially are the mass matrices of the fermions. And we solve them for the embedding tensor components themselves, given in terms of the, uh, you know, the scalars and the killing vectors and the, the pre-potential of n equals 2 supergravity. We solve these guys at some point, the n equals 1 point. So afterwards, this guy is no longer, uh, it's no longer a matrix of things that can transform. It's really a set of constants. And that's why it's important that you fix everything at the n equals 1 point. So basically then what we find is that we could solve for the charges and the gaugings in this n equals 2 supergravity, and we could find all the charges and gaugings which would give rise to n equals 1 vacuums. So in some sense we find the, uh, we find the space of theories which will allow you to have partial spontaneous uh, supersymmetry breaking. So it turns out that these solutions actually had some interesting properties. Um, so in particular, the solutions in themselves, so these embedding tensor components, are really just the charges of the theory. They're given entirely in terms of the killing vectors, k, and the pre-potential in the n equals 2 theory. And the n equals 1 condition can be solved if there's two commuted isometries. That's the only condition we had, really. So some properties of this is that it turns out that there's no constraint on the vector multiplets whatsoever. It turns out that everything was protected from quantum corrections. So we looked at the various instanton corrections too that one can consider, and this didn't change the result. Interestingly, if we tried to find a string interpretation for this set of charges within n equals 2 supergravity, we find out it was given by precisely the kind of non-geometric fluxes that the guys were talking about in the last two talks. So this is pretty interesting. We also uh, we extended our result, which was um, 
on some general grounds for quaternion ionic Kähler manifolds. We extended this to all the uh, quaternion ionic Kähler manifolds that are in the C map. So these are the ones that come from string compactification. And as I mentioned already, both n equals 1 and n equals 2 vacua can exist inside the same Kähler cone in one of these theories, which is also nice uh, to see. But we find some further surprises along the way. So having found the various n equals 1 vacua of n equals 2 supergravity, thanks. We then decided to look at the low energy effective theories in these vacua. So what we have, what we had before were all the charges which in field space would give us the points where we have n equals 1 and not n equals 2 supersymmetry. So now you can go to one of these points and you can study the low energy effective theory in that vacuum and you can see what you find. Now, obviously the first thing you find is n equals 1 supergravity because that's the amount of supersymmetry you have. But then it turns out that because we have n equals 1 coming from n equals 2, it turns out that there's an additional constraint which enforces a very large number of the massless scalar fields to become massive. So this is really the four-dimensional version of moduli stabilization. And this comes for free when you spontaneously break supersymmetry from n equals 2 to n equals 1. So for instance, if you have cubic <coughs> prepotentials in your n equals 2 theory, then all the vector multiplet scalars get fixed. And uh, a little more than half of all the hypermultiplet scalars get fixed for free. And that's pretty, that's pretty neat. So when we were working out this low energy effective theory, it also led us to uh, a new construction of Kähler quotients of quaternionic Kähler manifolds. This was interesting for, for the mathematicians in Hamburg because previously um, Kähler manifolds were constructed as sub-manifolds of quaternionic Kähler manifolds. And there was a strong bound on their dimension. And this new quotient construction allows you to have a far larger, um, a far larger dimension for the Kähler quotient. We also find out along the way that all the quaternionic Kähler manifolds in the C map have a natural global complex structure, which is pretty interesting. So furthermore, um, what we've been doing recently is seeing how you can extend these various results to rigid spontaneous um, partial supersymmetry breaking. And that's interesting, but there's some trickiness when you try and match the two theories together, uh, looking at the global limit. And very recently, we studied, we used the same techniques that we used here for partial breaking, just to look for n equals 2 supersymmetric ADS vacuum in n equals 2 supergravity. So this has been a, a big topic over the years. And we find a quite surprising result, we think. We find that in n equals 2 supergravity in 4, 5, and 6 dimensions, there are no n equals 2 ADS vacua which come from SU3 times SU3 structure compactifications of type 2 string theory and M theory. So this is quite surprising, we think, and this is because of the kind of symmetries which appear from these compactifications. So this brings me to my conclusions. Um, all I really wanted to convince you of today is that the embedding tensor formalism has useful applications beyond constructing the most general supergravities that you might be interested in. It actually has applications when you want to study uh, particular physical properties of those theories too. And I hope I convinced you that what you're able to do with this formalism is choose the interesting physics that you want to find in your class of theories. And then you solve for these embedding tensor components i.e. charges and gaugings, which will allow you to have this physics. So our application was to study n equals 2 to n equals 1 spontaneous supersymmetry breaking in supergravity. And we find that it's completely fine and robust. Generally, you can find it, whereas before it was thought that very special choices were required for the matter content. We find that the n equals 1 low energy effective theory is not generic, and that many massless scalars become massive. So there's Moduli stabilization, which goes for free in n equals 2 <coughs> supergravity when you look at spontaneous supersymmetry breaking to n equals 1. I also mentioned that we find some new construction of Kähler quotients of quaternion ionic Kähler manifolds. And finally, this surprising result, we think that um, a very large class of ADS n equals 2 supersymmetric vacua are ruled out in 4, 5, and 6 dimensions. And this, uh, this has some interesting uh, implications for compactifications of type 2 and M3. Thanks. Um, Hi. 
about the SU3 times SU3, there has been some ADS solution found by Simpis and Lust, I think. Yeah, that's ago. right. Uh, we, uh, we wanted to write this straight away as soon as we saw this result. In fact, uh, I think it was within touch with us, not long after the paper came out. Um, yeah, so what we concluded was that, uh, so our, our statement is obviously strictly within four dimensional n equals two supergravity. And what we concluded is it's, it's likely that one uh, cannot consistently truncate the, the solutions that you find to four dimensions, perhaps. Oh, they're really ten. They're really ten-dimensional solutions somehow. But of course, because yeah. Okay, so it's about the dimensional reduction. Yeah, that, I think that's uh, what we believe. Right. Bobby, okay. um, what about is, this, is it useful for constructing n equals zero? And yeah, I've been wondering that a lot. I've been wondering that a lot. One question that I was always interested in is do there exist um, de Sitter vacua in n equals 2 supergravity in four dimensions? Okay, the state of the art at the minute is that if you have n equals 2 supergravity in four dimensions with only hypermultiplets, you cannot have a metastable de Sitter vacua. This is a no go theorem shown by Skruka, Louis, and uh, another of their collaborators, Martin. Uh, if you then include uh, vector multiplets, I believe it's still an open question. Certainly with the case of non-abelian vector multiplets. Oh, no, it's known that there's stable examples. There are examples. Yeah. Ah, okay. There we go. Yeah. Well, these were from 2004, right? Ah, so, so these are the examples of uh, Frey, Trajanti, and Van Boyen. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe Michelin. That's the big open question. There is a, a model of Ferrara and collaborators which uses one of their early, their early constructions with very special matter content and they claim to be able to construct a chiral spectrum but I believe the masses of the, the mirror fermionic partners are fixed to be at the same scale, basically fixed to be at the electroweak scale at the minute and therefore essentially already ruled out. However, I think there's, I mean, there's at least a, many people that you talk to in the area will say that you simply can't have a chiral spectrum coming from an n equals two. Um, I think it's maybe still to be studied a little bit. More. But how do you give a mass to a chiral fermion without Higgsing the gauge group? Exactly. I mean, uh, I mean, there's Higgsing involved, yeah, for sure. I, mean, I only know this one model where they where they they kind of get a splitting between the. Uh, I mean, the two sets of fermions inside the Dirac fermion and the two sets of Majoranas. So they managed to give a higher Majorana mass to one half of the degrees of freedom in the n equals 2 Dirac fermion. But it certainly goes along with uh, regular spontaneous symmetry break. Final question? Yeah. Um, the fixing of moduli, you're saying it comes from the fact, I mean, it originates from n equals 2, or could also it also be due to the specific uh, embedding tensor values you got? Absolutely nothing to do with the specific values. It's to do with the fact that you have asked for your n equals one theory to come from an n equals two right. theory, mm. and it's very, it's very robust and very simple. Okay, so that was just part of the session, and I would like to thank all the speakers again.